Christ is risen. Christ is risen. Christ is risen. Oh, that last one was kind of high. I guess we're three weeks post, you know, Easter Sunday, so it's so of course the resurrection wears off for us until next year, right? The value and meaning of it. No, I'm just kidding. I, I joke, but that's sort of the nature of our lives that we just kind of forget about things, which is why we gather here on these Sunday mornings, why we do this every Sunday, uh, because at times we all need to, to hear the good news, be reminded of who Christ is, the resurrection, and who we are because of all of those things, and to rejoice and say, hallelujah, Christ is risen. So welcome to worship, everybody. Uh, please do fill out your uh, attendance tear-offs, if you will, and we'll collect those during our time of offering. Uh, let's pray before we continue. Gracious and merciful God, you came to us as an infant born into this world, lived like us, experienced life like we do, all in the effort to help us to relate to you, to believe that you understand us in a way that creates relationships, creates fellowships, fellowship and inspires us to follow you as your disciples did. And God, when you ushered in the kingdom, your kingdom, the kingdom of heaven into our world, for all to see, we are a part of that world, God, and we rejoice uh, in the presence of that God, and we come to celebrate that, we come to experience that, and we come to take your kingdom back out into the world so that others may come to know you as well. Inspire us today and every day, God, and may you be glorified and magnified in our worship this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Please stand as you are able. The grace of our Lord, Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious God. Amen. This is the feast of victory for our God. Hallelujah.
our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Or stand. Oh, we had a hymn. That last one wasn't a hymn. That was a security. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. 
So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. For three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, he answered, Here I am, Lord. The Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. At this moment he is praying, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he may regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who invoke your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is an instrument whom I have chosen to bring my name before Gentiles and kings and before the people of Israel. I myself will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias went and entered the house. He laid his hands on Saul and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on your way here, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes, and his sight was restored. Then he got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. For several days he was with the disciples in Damascus, and immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. Here is the first reading. Thank you, God. Psalm 30 will be read responsibly. I will exalt you, O Lord, because you have lifted me up and have not let my enemies triumph over me. Lord, o Lord, my God, I cried out to you, and you restored me to health. You brought me up, O Lord, from the dead. You restored my life as I was going down to the grave. Sing praise to the Lord, all you faithful. Give thanks in holy remembrance. God's wrath is short. God's favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping spends the night, but joy comes in the morning. While I feel secure, I said, I shall never be disturbed. You, Lord, with your favor, made me as strong as the mountains. Then you hid your face, and I was filled with fear. I cried to you, O Lord. I pleaded with my Lord, saying, what profit is there in my blood if I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you or declare your faithfulness? Hear, O Lord, and have mercy upon me. O Lord, be my helper. You have turned my wailing into dancing. You have put off my sackcloth and, off and clothed me with joy. Therefore, my heart sings to you without ceasing. O oh Lord, my God, I will give you thanks forever. The second reading is from the New Testament book of Revelation, the fifth chapter, beginning with verse 11. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels surrounding the throne and the living creatures and the elders. They numbered myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, singing with full voice. Worthy is the Lamb that was slaughtered, to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might, and honor and glory and blessing. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them singing, to the one seated on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. Here ends the second reading. Thanks be to God. Please stand as you are able for the gospel.
Gospel according to St. John, the 21st chapter. Glory, Glory to you, o Lord. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he showed himself in this way. Gathered there together were Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Canaan in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. And they said to him, we will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, you have no fish, have you? They answered him, no. And he said to them, cast the net to the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast it, and now there were not, they were not able to haul it in, because there were so many fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that, it was the Lord, he put on some clothes, for he was naked, and he jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, only about a hundred yards off. When they'd gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread. And Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore, full of large fish, 153 of them. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, Who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your old belt and go wherever you wished, but when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which he would glorify God. After this, he said to him, Follow me. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. <clears throat> Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Two of the four scripture readings we had before us today, two of the sort of pillars or icons of the New Testament, uh, are central to the stories in the book, uh, the Gospel of John, and in the book of Acts, Peter and Paul. Where's Mary? You know, never mind, I'm sorry. It's <laughs> something for you that are of my generation would understand. Um, John gets in there because it's his Gospel, and maybe you notice those things that John likes to... John's kind of funny. It's like he refers to himself in his book as the one that Jesus loved. Even though there's a lot of Peter in John's Gospel... He just wants you to make sure that you know that he was the one that was truly loved by Jesus, not the rest of them or loved more by them. But, um, and then the focus is on both of them. And, and one is a story of redemption or restoration. One is a story of conversion. Um, the story of Peter being restored to Jesus, the, the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after his resurrection 
in John's Gospel. Uh, the first two were those that I read last week when they were hunkered down in the, uh, the house and Jesus just popped in and popped out two times. The second time to um, engage with Thomas. Uh, but this third time, and, and it does seem odd to me, and maybe it strikes you as odd as well. It's like, why didn't Jesus just stick around for a while and continue to teach and encourage and explain? Maybe he did. It's just not recorded that way. And we don't have an idea what the time span is between first or the second time he appeared and this time when he appeared for the final time in John's Gospel. Um, and, and does so in sort of an odd way, feeding them breakfast and cooking fish and there's bread and there's things. But it's really about the end of that story, I think, the end of that, that section I read, where Peter is restored. You notice that Jesus asked him three times and Peter denied Jesus three times. Kind of ironic that Peter, after the third time, felt his feelings were hurt. The third time Jesus asked him, I wonder how Jesus felt the third time Peter denied him. We tend to make things about ourselves, um, And I don't want to go into all the details of the various, uh, the two different words that are used for, uh, that Jesus uses for love to encourage Peter. But it's just to kind of point out that Peter is one of those icons that, yes, is somewhat relatable to us. Because Peter's a bit of a misfit. Peter denied Christ. Uh, Peter sometimes sticks his foot in his mouth and is act, acts rashly and uh, sometimes does things that he perhaps regretted. Um, but he certainly is uh, an icon and a pillar for the church because Jesus at some point says to him in another gospel, uh, on you the foundation of this church will be built. I don't think it's exclusively Peter, but Peter being one of those that obviously would be instrumental in the growth and the, and the history, the, well, the growth and sustaining of, of the church. And then there's Saul, who is converted into Paul, and that story in the book of Acts is his conversion story. Prior to that chapter 9, there are uh, a few chapters there where Saul is involved, and he is, in fact, uh, doing some very awful things. He is murderous. He is persecuting. He is doing everything that he can to make sure that this way, as it was referred to, the Jesus way, has absolutely no momentum and he's going to do whatever he can to stop it. If that entails killing every Jew that believed that Jesus was the Messiah, Saul was going to do all of that. And he was on his way to do more of it in places away from uh, his hometown in Jerusalem where the high priest would have been. He was taking his murderous rampage out into the world. Think about what Jesus said at the end of his life. Or when he, the end of his ascension when he said to his disciples, go out into the world and baptize in my name and the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Here, Paul is going out and killing in the name of God the people who believed in Jesus. And this unbelievable moment where this bright light shines upon him and this voice from heaven comes and speaks to him dropping him to his knees, blinding him. The others around him hear it, but Saul is struck by <clears throat> a sense of awe, and he has, well, he seems to know that it's God who is doing this. And he asks, who are you, Lord? And Jesus says, "I'm. it's me, Jesus, the one that you're persecuting. There's not much more explanation to it, and as the story continues, does get a little bit odd and strange. I, I envy people like Ananias that can have these conversations with God. I'd love to have a conversation, even if it was just a brief exchange of, hey, go to the house where that murderous, rampaging Jew is killing everybody, and I want you to speak to him and tell him that I sent you. Uh, no, thanks anyways. Um, and they have to continue on this exchange, but the point is, Saul becomes that pillar of the church. He is the one that God has chosen, not exclusively, to speak to the Jews and to the Gentiles. Imagine the powerful witness that, that Paul, now Paul, would have had, particularly to the Jews, and the fact that he was exemplary in his status as a Jew. 
according to observation of the law and everything else, and a Pharisee, who would have a greater influence on, uh, on the Jews than someone like Saul? And God chose him, someone who nobody would have thought would have ever been a convert to the way. God came and intervened, and he became quite possibly the most, well, certainly the most influential writer we have in the New Testament, but again, someone like Peter. And, and we speak about, and I preach about the people in our scriptures quite often, even in our Bible studies. We've been studying uh, First and Second Samuel, and I've talked about Samuel. We've read about Samuel. We've read about the other Saul, the first king of Israel, and a lot of time reading about David, those icons as well of the faith. And in doing that, in speaking about those people, it just it kind of occurred to me, at least as far as this sermon is concerned today, that those are awfully lofty and high standards to sort of think about or live up to. It's not that I or most other pastors, preachers would say, you need to be like Peter. You need to be like Paul. He's an example for us. You need to be like Jesus. Because when he says, follow me, that's what he's saying, right? You be like Jesus. But when you can start walking on water, uh, when you can heal the sick, when you can raise people from the dead, when you can do those things, yes, be like Jesus. Again, it's not that those things are spoken, but in a way, I think it does, at least from my perspective, I'll speak for myself, make me feel somewhat of a sense of inadequacy. Like, I can't be like those people. I haven't had those conversations with God where he speaks to me and I get to have this exchange and ask him a question and he tells me exactly what he wants me to do. Any day now, God, it'd be great. Jesus, go ahead and show up. Let's start having a conversation. Um, but notice something that doesn't get noticed and didn't get noticed the first or second or tenth or even the first time this week that I read some of those stories was that it really stood out to me this morning. I guess... Jesus did speak to me this morning because this is where the sermon came from. Um, was Peter alone in his encounter with Jesus? How many other disciples were with him? Well, there was 12 of them, right? So, but in the story, how many were there? Four, five, six. June! Winner, winner, chicken dinner! They were named, well, four of them were named. Um, well, I guess there was six with them. So four of the, five of the seven got named. Uh, let's see, there was James and John, the sons of Zebedee. There was uh, Nathaniel of Cana. You remember him, right? Uh, there was two unnamed disciples. That's a major part of the story, but we focus, again, to make my point, we're thinking about Peter. Because he was the guy that was naked fishing and jumped out of the boat to go see Jesus. Those of you who fish in boats, are you glad that that did not become a Christian thing, right? If you're a Christian, you got to fish naked, Jeff? That's not a thing, right? Uh, they got people that go shirtless. <laughs> yeah, but different. Um, yeah. They're very much a part of that story. They were with Peter when Jesus appeared to them. He fed them breakfast as well. When Paul was walking along the road to Damascus, he was with others. They, they weren't named, but there were people with him. And perhaps because of their experience, they heard the voice of God. They didn't see anybody. What was their experience going to be like? And even Ananias, though a minor player in the story, I would imagine that Encounter had a huge impact on him. The point is, there's always people around. It's rarely just the main players. And if I ask any of you, if you ask me to name all 12 of the original apostles, I'm not sure I could get all 12 of them. Y'all remember Bartholomew? Nathaniel of Cana. Somebody please tell me the things that Nathaniel did that are recorded in Scripture. The other Judas, because there was a second Judas, not Iscariot. That's unfortunately his, his name and how he is titled in Scripture, 
Judas, not Iscariot. <laughs> Are you the Judas? No, no, not Iscariot. Not Iscariot. I'm the other, I'm the other anonymous sort of Judas. I guess you would choose that other than well, yeah. Were they vital to what happened in Christianity? Were they vital to the movement of the way? Did they play a major part in what took place for the gospel being proclaimed in Judea, or Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and throughout the ends of the earth? Were, were they responsible also for going out and baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Were there others who were with them? Because often in the Gospels we read that it was not just the disciples or apostles, but it were, was also those who were with Jesus. There's a few in Scripture who stand at the forefront. There are a few of them. But there are far more countless, anonymous, the other two disciples who were with and part of the story. And our names aren't going to be recorded in Scripture. Our names probably won't be remembered 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. I mean, there was a lot of people attending this church 50 years ago that you, that most of you, never heard of, and a few of you may remember some of them. It seems as though our lives can feel it's sometimes insignificant in terms of the encouragement to follow Jesus. Because what difference can we make? How do we make? Can we? Should we? Is it even worth the effort? I feel inadequate because I don't know the scriptures and I don't know the right prayers and I. I just don't feel compelled to be a part of a, a youth ministry or whatever kind of ministry it might be. I, those things that my church, my, my church offers out don't, don't seem to connect with me. And my life is busy and I have people to take care of and a job and I have any number of things. And, and it can feel like sometimes unless we're intentionally being a part of something, big like that, that we can't make a difference. But I can't help but to think as the anonymous others that don't get the credit for it, we're really the ones that make a difference in this world. And it doesn't require a great deal. If you're a great baker, I mean, I'm, I don't know, and this isn't a, I'm not guilting you or shaming you into anything, Sarah, but if you have a neighbor or a friend that you know is dealing with a difficult circumstance, you know, a half a dozen cupcakes or cookies can make a huge difference. Reaching out to a person that's struggling with something and say, hey, I just want to tell you I'm thinking about you, I love you, and I'm praying for you. Even if it's not a fellow Christian, you encounter somebody in a public space, wherever it is that you are, whether it's a job or a grocery store or a bank or a fast food restaurant or whatever it is, it can make a difference. Recently, I was at a doctor's appointment with my wife, and we were just sitting there randomly waiting for our turn, because that's the best part about going to see a doctor. I had an appointment, right? That's my appointment to come and wait. And a woman that's probably a little more, a little older than I was, or I am, was with her mother, and we were sitting apart. There was plenty of other people in the waiting room, but um, this woman just got up, walked over, and handed my wife a card and said, you know, I, she explained why she was there and what was taking place and she said, I just want to offer you some encouragement because and she didn't really give a reason, but this little card had a passage from Romans, I think it's 13, about, you know, nothing can separate us from the love of God, not heights, depths, principalities, whatever, nothing can separate us from the love of God. I'm wearing a Christian t-shirt. I always wear, that's pretty much the only t-shirts I have. Maybe I was, we were a safe mark, but I have to think that God sort of spoke to her and said, go talk to those people. And she did. And she just left it at that. She didn't say, repent or die or go to hell or anything else. But that simple act, 
at that moment meant the world to us because someone else was thinking about us. But it, it also struck me as a pastor, like, you know, that was super cool. And it didn't take a great deal of effort. And I've had those experiences where I felt like God was sort of speaking in my heart. And it, it's not explainable. He doesn't speak to me audibly, but there's something in me that says, notice that person or that situation or that circumstance. And I think I would like you to intervene. And I don't need you to go over there and solve their problem. I don't need you to go over there and fix them. I don't need you to do anything other than just to say to them, there's a God that loves you. Or I don't know what you're going through, but you know, my experience is that my faith has really lifted me up. You don't have to print cards or anything else. And, and that's just one of a limitless number of things that we could and should and can do in this world to make a difference. Individually, we're not saving people. Individually, we're not bringing people to Jesus. Collectively, as the church, we're not even doing that because that's the work of the Holy Spirit. But God, in His absolute abundant grace, allowed those of us who are the anonymous ones, the others, the Nathaniels of Cana and the Bartholomews and the Judas not Iscariots, to be the power of the gospel in a world that needs to hear it that needs to share it, that needs to know that they are, too are loved. And we get that privilege. And it's not an obligation. And so I offer this as a word of encouragement to you and to myself and to everybody else, anybody else. Be yourself. Figure out what it is that you enjoy doing, what you're good at doing. Maybe if you're not that great at doing it, just to make an effort to do something for someone else, a friend, a relative, a complete stranger. The difference that that can make in somebody's life could be eternal. You could be a part of something, working with and sharing that, that, that proclamation that Christ has risen with Christ, doing that in our own world. And think about what a difference it would make for all of us. you don't mind, please stand as you're able. We've got the verses of Hebrews 3 9.
was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Set free from captivity to sin and death, we pray to the God of resurrection for the church, people in need, and all of creation. Holy one of new beginnings, fill us with new life. Send us into the world as you sent your apostles, Philip and James, to invite people to come and see your wondrous acts in Christ. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Revive ecosystems along the coastlands that have been devastated by natural forces and human negligence. Reestablish plant and animal life that purifies air and water and that feeds humans and other living creatures. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Accompany laborers who get little rest from their work. Give them hope when they struggle to produce what they need. Give all who labor fair treatment and just wages. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. prayers. Restore all people who cry to you for help. Turn their mourning into dancing. Clothe them with joy. And put a testimony of healing and praise on their lips. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. prayers. Be present to faithful ones who are persecuted for following you. Sustain them by your faithfulness and give them strength in the name of Jesus. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. prayers. Healing God, we lift up prayers of intercession for those who are in our, on our prayer list, those who are in need of healing, of hope, of strength. Come to them, God. Help them to feel your presence. Restore them and heal them as they each have need. We pray this also for those that we name silently in our hearts. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Join our voices with angels, creatures, and all the saints in praising Christ and bestowing upon him all blessing and honor and glory. Reveal Christ's glory to us and through us in our worship. God, in your mercy, hear our, hear our prayers. prayers. And in your mercy, O oh God, respond to these prayers and renew us by your life-giving spirit through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you all. And also, also with him. Please come and share God's peace with one another.
lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, Almighty and merciful God, for the glorious resurrection of our Savior Jesus Christ, the true Paschal Lamb, who gave himself to take away our sin, who in dying has destroyed death, and in rising, has brought us to eternal life. And so with Mary Magdalene and Peter and all of the witnesses of the resurrection of the earth and sea and all their creatures, with the angels and archangels, cherubim and seraphim, we praise your name and join their ending hymn. <laughs>
Please stand as you were able to receive the blessing. May the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you forever in his grace. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, a couple of announcements this morning. Um, we finally did get our shipment of these small Christ in your homes, in our homes, your homes, our, our homes, your, our, uh, you probably saw them when you came in, but just in case you didn't, they're back there. Uh, so help yourself, grab a couple of those. If you would like to give them to people, that's absolutely fine. We have more in the back in the office. Um, so we, I, we, it's been, we've done, been, so quite a few years ago, we did this thing called the Facility Renewal Fund. And I know there hasn't been much evidence of things being done, but there's been an effort, I'll, I'll at least say that, and we are working towards producing something. But um, one of the challenges, and there have been a number of those, is that hiring people that will do good work and not charge us an arm and a leg, is not something that's easy for us to identify. People don't show up when we have appointments for them to come and give us estimates. They get, I mean, it's just, it's difficult. With personal sort of testimony of, I had this person do work for me, or my neighbor, or something, that would make it easier for us to have those kinds of personal references. Right now, we're mainly looking for people that can do some painting and or either door work or carpentry work to make our doors look nicer. Um, if you know of somebody, a contractor, a painter, or somebody that you've worked with or know someone closely enough that has said, I would hire them again, please let myself or Brenda know so we can reach out to those folks and then maybe start getting contacts with these people and hopefully they show up and hopefully they give us a reasonable bid because that's been the other problem. We've had people show up. I don't, I don't know if I've ever said it, but we were doing electrical panel replacement in the fellowship hall, one guy that showed up, by the way, he was the only electrician in the Christian uh, directory that we have in the back. That's, we don't have them back there right now, which is probably a good thing. We just got new ones. I wouldn't put them out. Um, he said that it would cost $80,000 to fix our electrical problem because it wasn't just the panel in the fellowship hall. It was the main panel, and it was this panel, and it was digging up and trenching and everything else. Okay, seems to be working out pretty well right now without spending $80,000, but you know, he was a good Christian man. Yay. Uh, anyways, so if you could, that would be super, super helpful. Um, donuts and coffee, we're still waiting for the organ repair people. That again. Yeah, same, same situation. They, they're going to fix it when they get around to it. If they get around to it. So they'll be here. We've been waiting. Anyways, that's kind of where we're at with some of those things. Um, other than that, I don't know. Do we have prayer meeting this week? Yes. First, first Tuesday? First and third Tuesday. Okay, of the month. So prayer meeting at 11 o'clock. 10. 10 o'clock in room 6. Bible study continues at 11 o'clock on Wednesday mornings and 7 o'clock on Zoom. On Wednesday evenings, please feel free to join us. I think that's it. Is that it? Jeff has something. Oh, Jeff has a thing. Oh, is that a fishing story? <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, fishing with dirt involves lots of shirt. Anyway, um, so uh, kind of piggybacking off the so waiting for order repair stuff. Um, particularly how the traditional service works is I write every hymn out in notation and then trans and then save that music notation as an audio file that gets embedded on these slides every week. Um, yeah, so uh, how this works is each piece of music is embedded on a file here. So when I click it, it should play. Um, sometimes it does it home. Sometimes it doesn't. It, no, it works at home great. Um, but the thing is, I may not always be here to make that clicking happen. Because I need a vacation. <laughs> Amen. And so I'm thinking on uh, May 22nd, uh, after service, I'm going to run a little workshop on how to actually run a worship computer for both contemporary service, which is super easy, 
and this particular type of service, which is a little more complex. So I lately we've been working pretty well with me handing it off to uh, Keith over here on the last few weeks when it's been both uh, like one service, but it would be nice to have one person who's able to handle all of this stuff, or multiple people being able to handle all of this stuff. Um, so I'm looking for to grow a group of volunteers who can run the slides. And so I'm going to run a workshop on how to turn the computer on, or turn the computer on, get the program set up, troubleshoot all the hiccups that usually happen. Um, so that'll be after church on May 22nd. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, we don't have someone to go. He's on vacation. It's going to be a really short circle. Because <laughs> I can't do that in this. So, nevertheless, uh, let's uh, conclude our worship with our closing hymn. Please stand as you are able. face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and in all things fill you with his peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our worship here is ended. Now our, our service, service begins. Go in peace and serve the risen Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.